Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, Episode 189. So if you had a, a mine or an oil field in a remote area, you might deploy your own private cellular network. And some public safety agencies have their own cellular networks as well. And what's happening is that model of private network ownership is starting to become more prevalent in 4G and 5G. Wireless LAN Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless LANs. This Wireless LAN Professionals podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless LAN veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Hello, this is Keith Parsons again with Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, and today I have with me Dean Bubbly. Dean, how are you today? Very good, thanks, Keith. Uh, good to uh, finally uh, get a chance to come on the show. I guess the question is, where are you? And I think you travel more than I do. I'm actually sitting in my living room in London for once, so I uh, um, haven't been traveling as much over the summer, uh, but it's probably all going to kick off again uh, over the next uh, few weeks and certainly in October, November. Well, you run a, an organization called Disruptive Analysis and uh, talk a lot about uh, telecoms, IT, networking, etc. Uh, the audience we're, we're talking to today are folks who do wireless LANs you know, day in and day out. And so they're seeing the world from the Wi-Fi perspective. You see the world from both that and the broader telecom world. So the first question to have up is a pretty simple one. I'm sure you've heard it a lot of times. Uh, in fact, I've seen you write about it. Uh, what's the difference between Wi-Fi and 5G? The difference between Wi-Fi and 5G, in it really depends on the context. You know, 5G is primarily a service provider technology designed as an upgrade to our normal mobile phone service um, in its current incarnation, 5G is basically 4G but faster, um, but with not as good coverage for now. In future, um, it may well allow additional capabilities of uh, guaranteed latency and performance um, in some cases and uh, is also suitable for uh, large scale deployment of uh, Internet of Things devices over wide areas, and also there's um, a use of it for fixed wireless access. So it's primarily an outdoor technology today, and I would classify Wi-Fi as primarily an indoor technology. The other big difference is that 4G, 5G, all the cellular in, um, technologies are mostly intended for service providers. So they actually have subscribers, a SIM card, uh, and so on. Whereas Wi-Fi, it can be delivered as a service well, with a subscription, or it can be just part of your LAN, uh, whether that's in an office environment or a home, um, or it can be provided as an amenity in a building, the same way that lighting and aircon is, uh, or for free and various other models. So Wi-Fi has a lot more delivery modes, whereas cellular technologies tend to be very oriented towards service providers. They bow down to the god of ARPU. Yeah, average revenue per user. Yeah, I mean, this is starting to change. Um, but by and large, 3, 2G, 3G, 4G, now 5G are intended for people who have typically a monthly subscription plan in, in markets like North America or um, have uh, prepay uh, top-ups, uh, and it's primarily phone-oriented users. Um, but again, there's usually a telco, a licensed mobile operator involved. That's starting to change with the advent of what are called private cellular networks. And in fact, they're happening first with 4G rather than 5G. And so, well, you've had a few of those for, for a while. So if you had a, a mine or an oil field in a remote area, you might deploy your own private cellular network. And some public safety agencies have their own cellular networks as well. And what's happening is that model of private network ownership is starting to become more prevalent in 4G and 5G, partly because of technology evolution, partly because there's more demand for it in, say, industrial facilities, uh, and also partly because a number of governments around the world, particularly uh, the US, Germany, and the UK, are changing access to licensed spectrum bands to make it easier to do. 
Wi-Fi on the other hand, Wi-Fi always runs in unlicensed spectrum where if you're deploying Wi-Fi, you don't need to ask the government's permission to put up an access point or run a device or a phone or a PC in a particular location once they're certified as being uh, meeting the standards. Whereas with cellular networks, you are a licensed operator operating in a particular, usually na nationwide band. And what's happening now is that the, we're getting smaller chunks of license spectrum suitable for individual buildings or small areas like a, a maybe an airport, so you know, 10 square miles or something like that, rather than national. And that's starting to change the calculus about whether it's worth building private cellular, usually in addition to Wi-Fi, not as a replacement for it. So those very small chunks of spectrum, um, have you seen the math on those? Are they costing for the license like you know 10% of the size of a band cost 10% or is it substantially more or substantially less as a ratio? Right. Right. Well, that's a really interesting one. I mean, in some cases, there's no license. And so in the US, for example, um, there's an innovation which is just kicking off called CBRS, uh, Citizens Broadband Radio Service. And that's a multi-tiered licensing structure where there's some incumbent users, which is mostly the US military, uh, which uses it for radar and things like that. There's going to be a certain amount of the spectrum that's just going to be sliced up on a county-sized area. Uh, and probably auctioned off next year sometime, mid, probably mid-year. No one yet knows what the prices are going to be. And then there's another chunk of spectrum, which is sort of like Wi-Fi, but your network has to essentially go to a database to ask permission to use it in a particular location at a particular time, essentially to say, you know, is there a, a you know, aircraft carrier with radar on? Is there um, a satellite uh, ground station or can I use this so it's almost like permission based like unlicensed spectrum as one of the tiers in the UK Germany elsewhere the cost of licenses will depend on how much spectrum you need 10 megahertz 20 40 whatever and the area over which you're you're going to cover it um, and so you know some of the proposals in the UK are as little as like a hundred dollars a year for a small amount of spectrum in a very small space um, which obviously is not a particular obstacle for most business users. But if you wanted to have a, I don't know, a 5G network running at 100 megahertz, you know, covering three square miles, then that's going to start costing proper money. So when you, you describe these um, current private LTEs, that's using the CBRS band, or are there people who are using current LTE bands? They're sort of the ones like, I don't know, if you're running a mine in the outback in Australia, there's probably some arrangement that you can do with the national operators to lease some of their their spectrum. So yeah, you can go to Telstra in Australia or whoever and say, can I have 10 square miles in the middle of the outback? Not going to cause any interference because there's no one living in a 100 mile radius. And the operator will say, you know, here's a contract. We'll do a deal for a, like a one off custom deal. Um, and there's some, some also some regulatory authorities around the world that have test licenses or sort of special bans for those sort of one-offs. Um, what we're talking about more now is whether we're going to sort of industrialize and commercialize that. Um, and so the, the current private networks, there's probably only, I don't know, 100 or so around the world. Uh, and some of those are government and military anyway. Um, and so as we go to the future, though, we may end up with thousands or tens of thousands or some people are even predicting millions. Um, th and the idea is to eventually try to make private cellular as relatively simple to deploy as mainstream Wi-Fi. I, I think that's a little bit over enthusiastic, but it's the direction of travel that um, both the, the cellular industry and also some governments are taking at the moment. I see in the CBRS world, it's actually the installation, design, and and usage of it is far closer to a Wi-Fi install than it would be a, a cellular install. So I'm predicting that uh, it's going to be more of a Wi-Fi engineers will be doing a lot of the work instead of the cell companies because it's, you know, below what they normally do yes um there's probably going to be a new tier of systems integrators you know specialists for particular sectors and industries who, who start picking this up so you maybe find that there's people who put in technology into hotels and resorts 
yes, they may well start doing some of the radio planning for this. One important difference, though, is that with Wi-Fi, it's just the access points and the switches um, yeah, and, and security software. With cellular, you also have various other bits of, of machinery there. So there needs to be a core network, um, which is a software function that does um, a lot of the control functions for the cellular uh, network, particularly if there's a risk of interference with the outdoor network into indoor. Uh, depending here, there's um, a lot of complexity around um, the new forms of security and authentication. Typically, it will use either a SIM card or perhaps an eSIM. That might change with 5G, where you can use other um, credentials. Um, and then you also have to think about: Do I need to have a number range? Um, in some cases, will look like a proper cellular network with all of the billing and operations management software and the interconnect and roaming and you know a lot of other moving parts. So that's particularly the case if you want to have it as dual use of both a, pro- a purely private network, but also allow external cellular networks to sort of roam onto your private network. Um, so there's, there's going to be lots of different ways that manifests in future. Or you could have, uh, like for a hotel, just a, an internal only that, no, you know, your staff can't call out, but they can make internal calls. And that's a much simpler solution. Yes, absolutely. And what, one of the use cases here is replacing two-way radio, um, whether that's in a hotel or, I don't know, for an airport or a port or um, something like that. The people who traditionally have had walkie-talkies, you could run that instead over a private LTE network. And there you probably find that the small cells you use have uh, probably better range than typical Wi-Fi access points, depending on the spectrum band and how they're engineered. Um, and, and certainly, given that use case, obviously, is one with a fair degree of mobility. If you've got people on you know, luggage carts or something whizzing around an airport, um, then, yeah, that's a slightly different use case to one you'd normally do with Wi-Fi. And you wouldn't have to integrate with the whole rest of the cellular or network. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask, since you kind of uh, spread across multiple genres of, of technology, what are the, the terms in the CBRS LTE world for devices that we use in the Wi-Fi world a little differently? Like we call it an access point on the CBRS side. They don't quite use those same terms. No, it's a CBSD uh, is um, is the specifically the CBRS version of a cellular small cell. Um, so in the cellular world, you will typically find the term small cell, which is like a evolved from um, pico cell and um, you know, microcell and very essentially they're base stations which are um, or cell sites which are shrunk down to something approaching a, a wi-fi access point worth of size so that's a slightly different category of product is you know different different chipset different uh, levels of complexity and because it's running um, typically in licensed spectrum bands there's a different you know, regulatory and certification regime for those things and um, particularly with CBRS um, there also needs to be some way for these devices to check up with the what's called the SAS the spectrum access system I can't remember the, the acronym uh, but essentially that's the database that tells a given network whether it's allowed to use a particular band place in a certain place and time or whether there's other users in that in that location um, sharing the band which it needs to work around so that's obviously not the case with wi-fi where you have that sort of regulatory requirement and those are called cbsd yes a little harder to say than ap exactly and, and there's also a proxy device which is sort of like a gateway if you've got a multi cbsd deployment in a building uh, there's i think it's called a domain proxy i mean all it's still very very early days for cbrs the the first initial commercial deployments um, are due well, now. Really. There's a launch event in September, and uh, those early commercial deployments will then be assessed again by the FCC and I think the US Department of Defense. And then there's going to be like the full scale deployments after that. And then sometime in 2020, you'll get the auctions of these what's called protected access licenses, um, which is probably going to be of more interest to the carriers as well as enterprise. So it's, it's sort of it's been a long process on CBRS. And that's partly because the, the say the main users of that spectrum ban historically have been the U.S. Navy, who 
you know, understandably were a bit wary about uh, uh, sharing this spectrum with anyone else. I live here in uh, Salt Lake City, and well, near Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, we don't have any aircraft carriers here. I was going to say, well, that was that's the whole logic is, uh, yeah, places like Salt Lake, you haven't got to worry. But if it was San Diego or if it was... Yeah, somewhere uh, in Maryland, it, it might be a slightly different uh, different story. But the military, they are the incumbent, and so we got to play, play nice with them. Yeah, there's a couple of other incumbents. There's also some satellite users and some fixed link uh, wireless connections as well. Um, but those are also relatively uh, few, and are, are there at specific places, and the database system will, will pick up on those. So it sounds a lot like CBRS is a kind of a baby set, because it's not a lot of spectrum, uh, compared to what's going to be rolling out in the 6 gigahertz that we have to ask permission. There are incumbents ahead of us already, but that 6 gig has got a lot of spectrum available for us. What's your, uh, since you're in the futurism kind of business, What's your, your prediction of when and, and how we'll be getting six gigahertz? That's a really interesting one. And to some extent, you get into the realm of politics as much as anything else here. Um, certainly, when I was at the uh, Wi-Fi Now show in Washington in, uh, I think it was May, um, the, the steer from the FCC seemed positive towards uh, Wi-Fi as getting access to some or all of that spectrum. The question will come down to whether there is some expected coexistence with cellular and on what form, what terms. Similar sort of argument I'm hearing here in Europe, which is the cellular industry is really gearing up its lobbying operation to say, well, we want this as well. And unlike uh, 5 gigahertz and um, LAA, um, Wi-Fi isn't the incumbent, so we don't have to play as nicely. Um, with listen before talk protocols as we did on that but the other argument is that the economic value from wi-fi um you know, and the not just the economic value but the sort of societal benefit from the innovation capabilities um could outweigh that but it's it's going to be a political decision as much as anything um, and it's really it's not something i can call at the moment um, either in the US or uh, or in Europe as to exactly how that, those bands get allocated or under what rules. And those rules might have uh, some tax implications, as in we, we can take tax revenue this cycle if we sell it, or it takes, you know, we get the, the ongoing societal benefit over a long period of time. Sometimes that short-term versus long-term might make it difficult. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. It's always the case with, with, with Spectrum and, and trying to make the, the argument for... Um, uh, I don't know, gains in productivity. It's quite difficult. And one of the things I quite like that the Wi-Fi Alliance has done in, in recent years is, is try to quantify um, the implicit value of Wi-Fi to consumers and businesses. It's always one of those things, whenever you see um, you know, technology X might add 2% to GDP or there's some large number with lots of zeros, you always have to question the methodology. And you you can bet that they've always, whoever's doing that, whether it's the, the cellular industry or the Wi-Fi industry, that the, they've probably been quite generous with their assumptions. Um, but actually having large numbers that you know, start with trillions rather than billions is always a, a good sign. And it, and it does sort of indicate to regulators and policymakers that um, this, is, this is not trivial. It's not just people playing games. It's real applications for enterprises, for consumers, developers, um, you know, public public sector inclusion, all sorts of things like that, which uh, you know, politicians care about as, as much as the tax side. We hope they continue to, to care that way. Yeah, exactly. It obviously depends on who it is and where it is and uh, the administration at the time. But uh, yeah, the, there are... There are some fairly persuasive arguments. One thing I will say is that, um, and, and uh, Keith, I think you were at the, the event in uh, DC as well. Was um, yes, I was. Yeah, FCC Chairman uh, Ajit Pai was there, and uh, I was quite quite interested in the fact that he turned up to a relatively small Wi-Fi conference and gave a speech which was custom written for it. And I normally when I see politicians speaking at events, yeah, they've got the usual presentation that they've given a thousand times before. And it was quite interesting. You know, he seemed to turn up and actually engage on this particular topic. Um, I think personally, he, he seems to be quite a fan of, uh, of Wi-Fi because of his own experiences, which is uh, helpful. I was a little, um, I don't know if disturbed was the right word, uh, disappointed when he, he explicitly said to get to the six gig, come on guys, go, go talk to your congressman, go out and we need your help. It's like, wait, you're in charge of this stuff. How can I help you? 
Uh, but but I guess there's uh, incumbents in that space that also have lobbying, and there's not that much lobbying from the Wi-Fi side. Yes, and, yeah, and I think that's that's true in North America, but it's particularly true elsewhere. And I don't think the Wi-Fi industry does a particularly good job of political lobbying um, outside of North America, especially. And I, yeah, I know if I if I travel to Brussels, um, you know, half the trams, posters, and adverts for 5G technology, and that's not because the local local operators are anything special. It's because the European Parliament's up the road. Um, yeah, I don't see the same if I'm walking through London or Paris or Berlin. I, I don't see anything extolling the general benefits of Wi-Fi, um, whereas I, I will see an awful lot of news items and you know, just general coverage of, of 5G. There's another issue here, actually, and this is one of the ones that I've raised um, with the industry, which is there's a lot of wireless industry innovators out there at the moment who are doing cool stuff with 80211 uh, IEEE technology, um, so variants of what used to be called white gig, or just sort of tweaks to the, you know, the technology used for giving greater range or particular uh, characteristics. But because it, all these things are non-standard, they're not allowed to call it Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi is the certified brand for products that conform to very, very strict specifications. So if you tune it and tweet it, it's no longer Wi-Fi and you have to call it 802.11 or you call it 5G because you get more press uh, press coverage. And so the, one of the problems I have at the moment with the industry is, is, is perhaps being a little bit too precious with the, the Wi-Fi brand. And maybe I'm wondering there should be a, almost like a, call it Wi-Fi E for experimental or Wi-Fi X or something like that, um, where you can capture all of these people doing cool stuff, which is almost but not quite Wi-Fi, uh, because otherwise you're going to lose the, um, the marketing war to the, the cellular industry. The downside of that is... Uh, the whole Wi-Fi term and the the brand is I can take my phone that's Wi-Fi and connect up to other Wi-Fi. The experimental is usually you have to have a CPE or something on both ends that play the same game. Absolutely. But I mean, I'm thinking here, for example, I saw a demo uh, in the UK of a race car being driven around a circular track um, at uh, 160 miles an hour with streaming uh, one gigabit a second um, and handing over... Um, every, I think, second or second and a half from one radio to the next as it was going around the circuit. And it was based on 60 gigahertz, 802.11 technology, but they were branding it as a 5G testbed uh, prototype because they couldn't call it anything else. And the question is whether or not you want to own those things and just say, well, no, it's not interoperable, but it's it's cool, it's possible future, it's a prototype, whatever it is. Um, or whether you're happy to um, to relinquish that and allow the the 5G industry to to own it. Well, and some of the in the 5G say that Wi-Fi is totally subsumed and in inside of 5G, so that 5G is is the the super you know carrier of everything, and Wi-Fi is just a subset. Yeah, I hear that quite a lot. And to be honest, there's a bit of a sense of entitlement sometimes in the cellular industry. Um, it's it's almost as if there's this sort of attitude that is the only wireless technology that matters. Um, and that uh, there's some sort of uh, right provided by through having licensed spectrum, which uh, conveys um, supremacy in some fashion. And I think that that attitude is likely to bite the industry um, back quite badly because blinds them, the cellular industries and the telecoms industry, to get all of these other innovations and the um, sometimes scrappy nature of wireless technologies. I'm thinking of some of the low power wide area stuff. Um, and also, you know, the sheer ease of using Wi Fi. And, and what I was going back to before of the difference between service, privately owned, and so on. The, the risk is that it permeates into the policy making uh, class, whether every, you know, politicians assume that 5G is, is the only thing that matters. And I find that some government authorities are better than others at seeing through the, uh, the sort of 5G wash, if you like. Um, and uh, you know, certainly the regulator that I have here in the UK, Ofcom, um, they're, they're quite wise to this. And uh, it's interesting, I'm speaking at a Spectrum conference in a couple of weeks' time, and uh, um, they're, they're very aware of the... Uh, the different roles of the stakeholders and and their different positions. <laughs> the, I mean, we're we're all in this for making a living, and we, as as long as you understand where they're coming from. Well, the last question I wanted to ask you is uh, IoT. Not not just in in general, we know what IoT is, but uh, your your predictions for IoT and what 
technology it's going to mostly ride on. There's there's uh, AH, there's 900 megahertz, two four five six uh, CBRS LTE. Uh, the idea of a device that's just you know a cheap little device on the network is a great idea. But where do you think where where do you think they're going to end up as the bulk? Oh, well, that's a really interesting one because yeah, you know, when you talk about IoT, really you know, depending who you're talking to, that could be anything from an individual sensor um, to a seven four seven. Um, yeah, and quite often you'll find them clustered together. So is a car one IoT device or is it 100 subsystems um, which are work in tandem? And I think there's no real clear answer here yeah, because clearly yeah, Bluetooth's not going to go away for connecting your headphones. Um, Wi-Fi is not going to go away for uh, connecting your um, you know, Amazon Echo or your TV to your um, your broadband. Um, where it starts to get a bit more variable is in, well, particularly things that don't move. So if you've got a sensor in um, a garbage a garbage can to tell the local authority whether it's full or not and needs to be empty, um, that's that's an outdoor use case. Or if you've got a smart building where the lights are trying to report on how much electricity they're using to the building management system. Um, in those cases. Yeah, it's it's really a pragmatic decision that's going to be taken by the application developer or sometimes the venue owner. And and I, I when I go to IoT events, I'm always surprised that they are much less religious about technology choices than the network people seem to think. I characterize it is that um, telecom people talk about IoT much more than IoT people talk about telecom. Um, yeah, and and so really, it's it's almost like an arcane discussion. So if you look at China, um, they've rolled out massive um, 4G narrowband IoT networks across the country, and they're used for a lot of municipal uh, functions or the um, the scooters and bikes on the streets. Um, and that makes sense from a mobility point of view. But then if you look inside buildings, um, Wi-Fi. Um, tends to be used for devices that have power sources, uh, sorry, uh, power connections. Um, Bluetooth and sometimes things like Zigbee tend to be more um, optimized for battery-powered uh, pr- uh, products. That's ba- those boundaries are starting to blur a bit, um, yeah, particularly with uh, some of the um, the advances like uh, 802.11ah. But yeah, up till now, that's been talked about, but hasn't really been commercialized to any great degree so you, know, you sometimes end up with a bit of a chicken and egg problem here um and we may also find that just sort of uh, uh wi-fi 6 has some features in it um which allow low power use there's um, i can't remember the name of the feature which allows you to sort of have scheduled wake-up times um, which I think is going to be a, a, an interesting, uh, perhaps, game changer for this. Lots of things going on, which is why we can uh, anticipate being in this business for a long time. It's uh, not going anywhere. Uh, so what's your next conference you'll be at? You mentioned uh, Spectrum Policy. Yeah, there's an Ofcom Spectrum Policy conference uh, on September 10th. Uh, in the U.S., I'll be at the IIT Real-Time Conference in Chicago um, in mid-October. And edge computing event in Austin, Texas in November the 6th, I think it is. Um, and then there's a few others that, you know, everything for it's a 5G one in Barcelona on 10th of October. I'm just to remember, I haven't got a list in front of me now, so I'm uh, trying to, trying to remember what else I've got coming up. There's one on, on carrier, a wholesale telcos and carrier interconnect and, you know, cloud services in London. Uh, in a few weeks' time as well. So there's quite a few things that I'll be at. So how would someone, if they wanted to read more of your writings, uh, where would they track you down, and what's your website? Right, well, first off, my, my Twitter handle is Disruptive Dean, and from that you can link to other things. My um, company website is uh, deanbubbly.com, um, but actually I put a lot of stuff and get a lot of interaction on my LinkedIn, where there's often posts and articles uh, with really good comment threads, uh, which I'll also link through from um, uh, from my uh, Twitter account as well. Well, we'll put all of those in the show notes as well. Uh, Dean, thanks for uh, taking some time to share your thoughts with our audience, and uh, we'll follow you on, on the Twitters. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Keith. Cheers. Thanks. 10 Talks. Raise your hands if you have a multi-vendor switch and or Wi-Fi solution. Okay. Raise your hands if you want to automate or manage that solution, multi-vendor solution. So a handful of you, right? 
Um, what I'm talking about today is really a, a problem that a lot of people are going to see more of. The challenge today is that with a multi-vendor solution, it's difficult to manage that from one, one platform. Um, as Mike Albano talked about yesterday, and he's doing a deep dive, there's some great ways to do that, and that's what I'm talking about today. So the problem really is that the different platforms have different learning curves. If you have Cisco, you have to learn multiple interfaces. If you have uh, Arista, you have to learn different things. If you have Aruba, um, multiple interfaces, very complex. As you know, Wi-Fi is actually a very complex um, system, and the switching side of the world can be equally complex. So having all these unique UIs and systems and different CLIs and different APIs is a real challenge to, to manage a multiple system. Um, and because of that, it's also difficult to automate because even though you may have APIs that can do certain things for one system, they don't use the same APIs for a different system. They don't use the same uh, syntax. They don't use the same um, data sets. They don't use the same um, anything. So to do, to do a real automation, you would have to take your different scripts that you've set up to automate and convert them to a different system every time you want to do that, every time you want to add a new vendor. So what's the, the real challenge here? The challenge is that you can't bring in multiple vendors. You're really locked into a vendor because you've got so much invested in, in learning, in time, in scripts, in automation, that it's really difficult to break out into a different vendor. So um, that and that limits flexibility and freedom, right? You want to be able to do change things and you can't do that. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is, I'm going to skip ahead just to save a little time here. The solution, solution is open config. Um, I'm not an expert on open config. I think it's a really cool idea. I think it's a, the way the industry needs to go is to be able to disaggregate hardware from software, to be able to manage different things without having to be tied into a vendor. I work for a vendor. Full disclosure, I work for Arista, but I fully believe in the industry that we need to be able to manage anybody's system from your own tools. You shouldn't have to be locked into a vendor. You should be able to buy the best of breed for whatever, for whatever resource on your network and manage it any way you want to. And not just manage it, but to do all the automation and do all of the troubleshooting you want to. Now, there's some great tools out there. You know, there's some great automation tools or there's some great network management tools out there. That's not trying to take the place of these network management tools. This is just a way to let you build your own tools for what you need to do. So what is open config? Open config is designed by users. It's not designed by vendor. Now, vendors need to participate because they have to have open config compliant devices. Um, but it's really about being vendor neutral. Um, it's about creating a model to be able to mo manage your different devices. So you have a model uh, managing, when you manage a Wi-Fi, for example, you manage a basic set of things like channel or transmit power. Those are the same across all vendors. You should be able to have a model that manages all those things no matter which vendor it is because you're managing essentially the same things. Um, you want to make it easy to use, so you want to make it a, a very uh, declarative configuration. You want to be able to get information from these systems to be able to do real-time management, to do real-time alerting. So you want to be able to stream telemetry when something changes to see what's going on. Um, and then again, you want to have a common data model for everything. You don't want to have to have a unique data model for one vendor. Now, that doesn't say you can't. A vendor may have a data model for their special sauce that you can still use open config to create your special tools with. Um, so open config is really user driven. It's driven by some of the largest companies out there. And as Mike talked about, Google is one of the driving forces behind this because they didn't want to be locked into a single vendor. So they started this open config concept. They started talking to vendors. They started getting vendors to be open config compliant so you could manage these things and you could build your own tools. Um, and this allows them to scale infinitely and, and really scale with any vendor at any time without changing their tools. So this is really about standards-based streaming, time-sensitive telemetry, seeing what's going on. The, the value of this is you can have bi-directional streaming. You can change things. You can see what's coming back through. Um, you can subscribe to a stream so you can always know what's going on. You don't have to do any polling. You don't have to do any waiting. You don't have to have any overhead. You subscribe and you receive the data. Um, and then based on that data, you can do whatever you want to. You can react to things almost instantaneously. Um, so basic open config components are the uh, Google real-time, uh, sorry, remote procedure call. So that's to be able to do things. Um, it's secure. It's right bi-directional. Um, it's all programmable. I mean, everything here is about programmability. There's some 
um, link there if you want to learn more about it. Um, another part of that is the network management um, of this. Same sort of thing. It's programmable. Um, it allows you to do uh, service differentiation, allows you to do different, lots of different things. So um, coming down to the wire here. Um, so to open config models allows you to do multiple things. For example, you can do discovery. You can see what's going on in the network. You can do set configurations of the model sets. Um, for example, like multicast routing or IGMP. Um, you can also monitor. You do a get or subscribe to get flow table information or link status. Again, you, with open config, you can get any kind of same data elements from disparate vendor solutions. And that's kind of the beauty of open config. So what this is really about, and what I'm really trying to convince people of, is that open config is a very valuable way of breaking vendor lock-in, right? So, and again, that's not to say that the vendors don't have add value. They do, they add a lot of value. They have their own systems, they have their own intelligence, they do lots of really sophisticated things. But with open config, you can do a lot of very basic management and, and sophisticated management if you want to by subscribing to open config, by writing to open config, and by um, buying vendors that have open config uh, data sets and models. Um, and I'll give you early time, thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless LAN Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi. <laughs>